Yes, welcome everyone. It is on. I can hear myself uh, echoed. I hope I'm not too loud. Let me welcome all of you. My name is Joy Connolly. I'm the interim president of the Graduate Center, and I'm so honored and happy to have you here. Uh, we are filmed uh, to let you all know that. We're going to immortalize this uh, this conversation, uh, which we, we, uh, we know is worth it, so we can go back to it and see it. Uh, again, and have it available to a larger audience that's here today. But we're really grateful that you're able to come uh, for this event, a conversation, panel discussion with the author and activist, Dr. Sally Rush Wagner. Um, so I'm going to leave it to others to introduce her, but I will just say a couple things about this event and, uh, and its integral connection to what we care most about at the Graduate Center, which is um, high-level thinking, high-level analytical thinking, um, frank conversation, frank expression of views, and engagement with issues of deep public interest, bringing to bear finally a historical sensibility to the understanding and grasp of these issues. Um, so we're very excited uh, to be working on this particular, the, the project uh, connected with Sharon Nelson, who will be here, I'm told, any moment. She was a little delayed. Um, but we're very excited to be working with Sharon on the certificate program designed to help people understand and prepare for the process of, work, of running for public office. So I'm going to leave you with that teaser. We're really excited about this. It's, it's part of a larger uh, group of programs, some of them certificates, some of them for credit, some of them not for credit. We're aiming to, uh, how to put it in a phrase, make the expertise and excitement um, and keen insights and wisdom and experience of people in the Graduate Center, faculty and advanced graduate students, in touch with the wisdom and expertise and keen insight of people outside the Graduate Center who want to learn more about what's going on in the building in terms of history, in terms of preparation for um, lives more of, more of deep civic engagement. And this certificate program that we're exploring with Sharon is one example of that, preparing people in this case for a specific experience, and that is running for office. So uh, stay tuned for that. The person running this, uh, this initiative, overseeing the, all these, what we're calling non-degree programs, although that's a very clunky bureaucratic label for, for these efforts, is Dean Brian Peterson, and I'm here to introduce him now. Um, Dean Brian Peterson, whom we all think of as Brian, I think Sally said she met him and became, uh, they became best friends in the first, the first minute, you'll see that in a second. Uh, his official title is Dean of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation. And his current work is focused in a couple of areas, but um, but mostly focused on this initiative I described, developing uh, innovative educational experiences that will respond to uh, to the to the busyness of people's lives and the diverse curiosities of audiences in and around New York City. He's leading new academic programs that are seeking to open up the Graduate Center to the public um, through a variety of uh, of different mechanisms. Brian was involved in the deeply involved in establishing and making a huge success of the School of Professional Studies, uh, where he started in 2003. He served there as the Associate Dean for Student and Community Affairs. Uh, but uh, his history with CUNY goes further back. He's a CUNY alum uh, with a Master's of Public Administration from Baruch College, and we were lucky enough uh, to bring him on board just last fall. So again, happy to have you here, excited about the conversation, and now I turn it over to Brian to take over the rest of the afternoon. Great. I'll stay here for a minute. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm texting with our moderator, which it makes us very exciting uh, <laughs> to me. So we're gonna we're gonna dive in, and um, I'm gonna. Actually, Sally, why don't you come up? Okay. Um, Can we all come up? Yeah, because um, I think we're going to mix this up a little bit. So I, it's a pleasure. Let me first by Sally. I think a number of you know Sally, um, but it's my real pleasure to introduce Sally Rosh Wagner, who, as many of you know, was awarded one of the first doctorates in the country for work in women's studies and was the founder of the first college-level women's studies program in the United States to offer students a minor in the discipline. Um, she currently serves as an adjunct faculty member at the Renee Crown University Honors Program at Syracuse University and the St. John Fisher Executive Leadership Program. Sally is an author of numerous women's history books and articles telling the untold stories. Her most recent publication is an intersect anthology, The Women's Suffrage Movement, with a forward by 
Gloria Steinem. And just to be clear, because some of you asked, yes, that's the book in the back. And yes, Sally will be uh, in the back after to sell her book and sign her book and talk with you. Um, so we're really delighted uh, to have you with us today, Sally. Thank you. Um, delighted thanks. to be here. So uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, Betty Lyons. And Betty, if you could come up, I know we're doing this a little bit out of the playbook, but um, we're gonna we're gonna start just a little bit differently, I think. So Betty is the president and executive director of the American <laughs> Indian Law Alliance, and is an indigenous and environmental activist and citizen of the Onondaga Nation. So we're delighted to have Betty with us today, and then my colleague, Dr. Julie Sook. And Julie is Professor of Sociology, Political Science, and Liberal Studies at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, where she also serves as our Dean for Master's Programs. Uh, formerly a law professor at Cordova Law School, she has published dozens of law review articles and books, chapters on constitutional gender equality in Europe, as well as the United States. Um, so we welcome Julie. And again, Sally and Betty. So thank you for all being here. So I'm going to uh, ask our panelists one: if you can pick your mic, you're going to need to talk into your mic for us to pick up what we're filming uh, when the time comes. And two: to bear with me because I'm going to pitch hit until Sharon gets here. So. Um. Okay. So Sally. We spent the afternoon together. Um, we were interviewed over at ABC Television this afternoon for Here and Now. Um, and we actually were delayed, so we had quite a bit of time to bond um, and form a friendship. And one of the questions I was asking as I waited was what was most surprising to you in putting together this piece of work? So I'll start there, um, and we can pick that thread up. I think, I think the most important for me is the breaking down the idea that history begins with white people on this land. And the wonder to me is that I am sitting next to a friend and a colleague who is part of a confederacy of nations where women have had political voice for a thousand years. So the humbling reality of that for me is that in the United States, we're celebrating a hundred years next year of having the vote secured. And I have the honor of sitting next to a woman who has a legacy of a thousand years of knowing what it is to have political voice. So. Would you speak a little bit about that, Betty? Certainly. Um, it's, it makes me very humble, um, and I'm very proud, first of all, to be sitting next to you. I, I cherish our friendship deeply. Um, our nation and our confederacy is over a thousand years old, and it's so important that um, people understand that our women aren't you know, more powerful than, but we have a balance, right? And I think that that's where the breakdown is happening today. Um, we miss that balance. Women in my community, it's a matrilineal society. So our land passes through the women. Um, our clans pass through the women. I have two sons, um, and they both are Snipe clan as I am. Um, and my partner is Eel, Eel clan. And so um, it's, it's a very different kind of mindset uh, than what you find here in, in the Western world. Um, taking of the last name, uh, you know, our, our, our names are connected to Mother Earth and they come from our clans. So I received my clan name, which is Ganya'a, it means small sky, and I received that from my clan mother. Um, and my children received their names from the same, the same clan um, in what we call the basket. The name is pulled out of the basket. Um, and they're all connected to Earth. My my youngest son is Dehamuwakwa, which means he lifts up the canoe, and my oldest son is Onegano, which means uh, cold water. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as he as he beautifully put it, when he was about ten years old, and our baby uh, got his name, 
he said, Mom, now all of us, our names are completely connected because you're the sky over us. Mm -hmm. My brother's the, the one lifting up the canoe and I'm the flow of water that runs underneath him. And I thought that was so beautiful. Um, and it just goes to represent the holistic picture and not, you know, how things are broken down in this society. You know, one of the things that white feminists are often asking me is, well, but can a woman be a chief or a sachem? Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from our seeing and living in a world that is really based on hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a very different way of making decisions. You know, majority rules and I wonder if you could explain a little bit about the consensus decision-making process and how does that balance with the clan mother and the sanction that she chooses? How does that work? Yeah, so it's very different. Um, our women choose our leadership. And so we, as in our clan families, will get together and look at um, these young men that are growing up to see if they have the qualities of a leader. Um, you know, do they have leadership skills? Are they compassionate? Are they kind? Um, are they gonna give back to their community? Are they gonna defend their community? Um, all of those things are so important in choosing a leader. And then as a family, all the women in the family kind of have these conversations. Um, and then leadership is chosen. So that is how one of our um, chiefs is put into place. They use the word chief, that's not our word. It's, it's a Western word. Um, Hoyane is our word, and so that that position would be filled. But if they're not doing their duty, we also have the right to take them out of leadership. And so I want you to, for a moment, picture what this country would look like if not only women chose the leadership, but also had the right, if after being corrected, you didn't stay on the path, you were removed. Um, all 49 chiefs, uh, our 49 chiefs, we have 50, 49 of them are chosen by clan mothers. Only one is chosen by all of the men, and that's my husband's title. He is our spiritual leader of our Six Nations, um, and he's the only one that has a different distinction. Mm -hmm. um, but, but other than that, it's, um, it's chosen by the women. And it's all consensus-based, so we don't vote uh, when our grand council gets together, which they get together in month, I, I don't want you to think that even though it's a thousand years old that um, <laughs> we don't, it's not continuing. This is a practice we continue today. I'm not a US citizen. Um, we, we did not accept citizenship. And so when we meet um, our leaders that are chosen, make those decisions by consensus, it's so much harder to get to consensus um, than it is a vote. I'll, I'll tell you, I've watched it personally for over 20 years. I've worked for my nation and watching them deliberate. Um, and it can get intense. Um, but know that they make their decisions based on our seven generation, yeah, I'm born. And they take that responsibility very seriously. And in a sense, the one that is not chosen by a woman has accountability then to all the women. To all the women. Yes, yes. That, that as a... And to uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things that, that, that you know, it, it's, it's, boy, for a white woman, it's a little hard to get my mind around this, amazing as it was for the suffragists mm -hmm. when they saw imperfectly, you know, these are women who have no right to their bodies. They have no right to their children. A husband could will away an unborn child, and that child would be given to its rightful owner when the child was born. You had no right to your own property. Anything that you earned became your husband's. Women were considered dead in the law once they married, had no legal existence. So, living in that kind of a world, husbands had the right to rape their wives. Marital rape wasn't outlawed until the 1970s with the second wave of feminism. And there are still some states in which under some conditions, men have the right to rape their wives. Women, husbands have the right to beat their wives as long as they did it without inflicting permanent damage. Uh, think about, you are a woman, a white woman at that time. 
and you meet up with someone like Betty, one of her ancestors, and you are going to have your mind blown. You know? You are going to see a world that you were told was not possible. Religiously, you are told that you are to be under the authority of men. Biologically, you're told that you're the clinging vine to the mighty oak. Well, you meet some mighty oaks and you launch a women's rights movement. And my thought is, and, and I don't expect anybody to accept anything that I say, but if you will look at the book, um, the anthology, it begins with the suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Alice Fletcher, as they are conspired by Native women. I have one quick story. Alice Fletcher at the International Council of Women in 1888. This is the first time that women gather on United States soil to talk about their rights. Women from all over the Western world. They listen to Alice Fletcher talking about her interaction with Native women. And she tells a story. One of the stories that she tells is, now, sitting with a group of Native women, these are Omaha women in the, the Midwest, and one of the women gave away a horse, and I, without thinking, said, hadn't you better check with your husband? And she said, the merriment with which my words were met. You know, it's kind of like, what the Atlanta did this woman do? Like, you know, like, they're just laughing their heads off. And then she goes on to say that, the women that she's talked to and the men, and one of the men that she cites is Sitting Bull. I was able to figure out that's who oh. she was talking to. And Sitting Bull said to Alice Fletcher, this suffragist, he was worried that when his women, the women, Native women, came under United States law, they would suffer even more than the men because they would lose their rights as Indians, but they would lose their position as women. They knew what was going on. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick moment. Sharon is here. Come on up, Sharon. We'll swap out. So, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sharon Nelson, who is the founder and CEO of Crew Civically Reengaged Women, uh, who we are partnering on. And uh, to keep the cadence, I'm going to have, I'm just going to turn it right over back to the panel. So thank you. Thank you, Dean Peterson. I apologize, and let's go on. Julie, I know that you have done amazing work in the women's, um, adding voice to the women's rights movements and championing things like equal pay and all of these things. What do you think when you read Sally's book and you really have um, a past connection to why things are staying the same? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, it's very complicated. So my work is primarily as a legal scholar rather than as an activist. Uh, and I've been interested in uh, women in constitution making, uh, which is both transgenerational and transnational. And it's transgenerational in that the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, which prohibited the denial uh, or abridgment of the right to vote on account of sex, uh, is really ratified in 1920. Uh, and many of the suffragists uh, in, uh, that take up most of uh, Sally's book, actually, uh, began the movement uh, around the time um, as abolitionists, um, around the time of even before the Civil War, so many of the suffragists actually did not live, like Susan B. Anthony did not live to see the 19th Amendment uh, ratified. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, these writings give meaning to what we understand the 19th Amendment to be about. Uh, and what's so interesting is that some of the things that Sally began to mention in this conversation about uh, women's lack of legal status uh, before uh, the 19th Amendment, although it's, it's interesting, as a legal matter, it's not the 19th Amendment that changes it. Uh, but changes in both judicial interpretation of existing law uh, and uh, legislative change that happens uh, even before the 19th Amendment is actually passed and ratified. 
And I'm talking about uh, all the ways in which women actually had no independent legal status, uh, independent of their husbands if they were married. So if they worked, uh, often they would be discriminated against and not able to work, but even if they were able to work, uh, the husband would own uh, their earnings. Uh, and women did not have um, equal guardianship over their own children. Uh, and so, uh, so in many, uh, and in many other respects, women really had no legal status independent um, of their husbands, and they certainly didn't have the right to vote. Uh, and so the struggle that uh, we often group with the suffrage movement um, dating into the 19th century is actually not really a struggle that's just about the vote. The vote becomes a symbolic entry point um, for everything else that's wrong with women's subordination uh, and women's lack of legal status uh, before we get to the 19th Amendment. Uh, and, uh, and what's very interesting is that the 19th Amendment is an amendment that really only refers to uh, voting rights. Um, it does not refer to equal rights uh, in, as a general matter. Mm -hmm. And so much of my work actually focuses on the struggle for equal rights, which is born out of the 19th Amendment. Uh, because it's right after the 19th Amendment is ratified in 1920, and there are a lot of fights involving litigation as to whether or not the 19th Amendment is actually a valid amendment. Uh, and, um, and there's an, a, a bunch of um, in interesting cases in the early 1920s about that before the Supreme Court. Uh, but right after the 19th Amendment is ratified and then women have the vote, part of the reason women wanted the right to vote was not simply to be able to vote, but to be able to have a voice in changing the laws uh, that gave them no legal uh, status. Uh, and so uh, once the 19th Amendment is ratified, Alice Paul, who is probably the most active and significant suffragist by the time that the 19th Amendment is ratified, uh, introduces the Equal Rights Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution in 1923. Uh, and the Equal Rights Amendment uh, was designed to remove all remaining barriers to women's equality of rights uh, as citizens. Uh, which is to say, any time that the law makes a distinction or treats men and women differently, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, which was supposed to be kind of the twin of the 19th Amendment, um, the Equal Rights Amendment was meant to, to fully uh, guarantee women's equal citizenship. Uh, and what happens with the Equal Rights Amendment, um, and just getting to, uh, back to, to, to today, uh, is that there are fights about and not fights just between the anti-suffragists and suffragists. The suffrage movement actually splits uh, in the 1920s um, over the Equal Rights Amendment uh, because prior to this time, there had been laws that actually protected women in the workplace. Uh, so there were laws that protected uh, women uh, from certain dangerous jobs. There were laws that uh, were uh, maximum hour jobs recognizing women's role in reproduction. Uh, and, uh, and many social reformers believed that we needed to have those laws to protect women, uh, but the Equal Rights Amendment was widely understood, and certainly by Alice Paul, uh, the suffrage, the significant, the most significant uh, person in the suffrage movement up until this time, uh, it's understood that you can't protect women uh, be, um, because they're women or because they're mothers, uh, consistent with uh, the vision of sex equality that's advanced in the ERA. And this is a struggle that continues to today. When the ERA was finally adopted uh, by Congress in, the in 1972, um, it didn't get ratified uh, by the requisite number of states. Uh, it came uh, three states short uh, because Phyllis Schlafly and other uh, women on the right uh, claimed that if you had equal rights for women, um, it would actually be bad for women. It would take away all these protections that uh, wives and mothers uh, needed. Uh, and this let, me, let me just sort of jump in. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut yeah. you off, but there's some very good points that you brought up, and I don't want us to lose that flavor as we go along. Um, and also to incorporate uh, Dr. Wagner into this thing. When Alice Paul in 1923 in front of that Presbyterian church, and she had this epiphany of an idea, I, I wonder what um, Matilda Jocelyn Cage felt about this stuff, and I want to turn it over to uh, Sally to just sort of talk a little bit about where suffrage meets ERA meets all the cacophony of voices in the movement. Well, what Matilda Justin Gage thought about it, we probably have to uh, decide what happens in the afterlife. <laughs> I think in her, but we can look at what she said during the time, in 18, uh, 62, she was asked to give the flag presentation speech to send the boys from Fayetteville off to war. And she said there will be no permanent peace until there is absolute equality for every group. Women and men, 
blacks and whites, native born and immigrants, rich and poor. And sometimes I speculate about whether the Civil War has ended, um, given that definition. But I want to speak for a minute to Julie. I feel like I'm in between two things that are very, very connected. Because I just read a summary, thank you, Julie, for of that brilliant paper that you've done, looking at that difference between the equality suffragists and the, the social um, suffragists, and the, and the need to implement parenthood into an equal rights thinking. And I think that that, you know, when, when we think just in terms of equality, we miss the knowledge that we could learn from Native women. But I wonder if, if you might say just a little bit more about how can that be, that, that looking at parenthood. Other countries, as you write in your paper, do it. And how can that be incorporated? Uh, which you do so well in your paper. Oh, so, well, I always say that um, were women citizens, or were women included in the term citizen uh, at the founding when the US Constitution was adopted? Were they included in the term citizen uh, when the, you know, after the Civil War, uh, when, the equal, uh, when the Equal Protection Clause, uh, the 14th Amendment uh, was adopted? Uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, after the Civil War, uh, in Minor versus Happersett says, yes, women are actually citizens, but voting is not a privilege uh, of citizenship, right? Uh, so that's how, how the law uh, kind of goes. But I, I actually think the exclusion of women um, from the vote uh, and other uh, public rights uh, at the founding is not an accident. You can think it's an accident. I mean, legend said, has it that Abigail Adams uh, said to uh, to her husband, don't forget the ladies. And oh, did they forget the ladies when they <laughs> wrote the Constitution? And they did not actually forget the ladies. The exclusion of women from rights is actually quite deliberate. Uh, and I think the deliberate, uh, but we shouldn't regard the deliberate nature of excluding women um, as an act of hatred. Um, it's actually the framework that existed at the time for raising the next generation, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a legal status, which is the family, Right? The family involves uh, a married couple uh, with children, and only one person in that married c couple can represent the family in the public sphere, have voting rights, because the other person um, is going to be very busy raising the children uh, and keeping the home. Uh, and this is the legal, the, our, our legal institutions, including the Constitution, are built on the assumption that that's how a nation gets reproduced. Right? Somebody has to raise the children, and if that person is too, is in Congress voting, right? And th these are the debates that are actually going on if you look at the history of uh, the 19th Amendment around the time of ratification. Uh, so, so I think it's not an accident that women are left out. They're left out because this was the arrangement for how the a a nation um, is reproduced over time. Uh, and a constitution is a document that's supposed to make sure that a polity survives beyond the people who draft it initially, right? Our institutions have been around longer than we have. Uh, and will continue to be around after we die. Uh, and so if you think of it that way, then of course, once you shift from inequality, exclusion of women, uh, to uh, inclusion of women, and not just inclusion, but full equality, um, it does mean that full equality has to have a new plan. How, how are people going to get raised? Uh, because if you're no longer assuming that women with subordinate status are going to stay home and raise the children, um, you have to have not just full equality, like that's what the law says, but you actually have to start building your institutions around the assumption that everybody who participates in the public sphere is equal, and is equal not only in the public sphere, but also at home. Uh, so my understanding of what it means to have equal rights, or even the suff suffrage, based on the debate that took place at the time, um, is that you can't just have the equal right to vote. You actually have to have a whole set of institutions um, that support equal parenting uh, and uh, a 21st century understanding of how how a new generation of citizens gets raised. Mm. Well, you have to understand, too, that America, compared to the contemporary countries, is a fairly young country. Mm -hmm. We're a nation of immigrants, and everybody that founded this country in a way was going running away from something that they had at home. 
So, so we're a young country, but we have the oldest constitution. Right, <laughs> right, right. But my no, point is yeah. about the whole circle yeah. of life. Yeah. 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 A Actually, no, you're, you're not the, the longest living democracy. Yeah. No, um, I mean the a constitution, the constitution in terms of the written document right. setting, uh, setting out the political institutions. Yeah. So, so on the shores of Onondaga Lake, which is only about four and a half hours north of here, was the birthplace of democracy. Mm -hmm. um, it's where they brought our five warring nations at the time together under a great law of peace, um, giving us all responsibilities, right? Responsibilities to Mother Earth um, and the responsibilities of men, the responsibilities of women. And that's, that's the balance, right? Um, the natural world, um, male, female, there's a balance there. So um, I would say, and I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying is that democracy didn't even happen in the United States until everybody got the right to vote. You know, until oh, then, until then it was, I mean, so it hasn't been that, that long. Um, and it was Obama, I think just a couple of, was it 2012, he said on the floor of the UN that they're the longest, the US was the longest living democracy. And my uncle said, not so fast. <laughs> He's 89 today, and he said not until, uh, you know, everyone was given that equal right. Um, and I think it's so important to think about, you know, where it went off the rails. You know, it went off the rails because women weren't included from the beginning, um, and they left out the voice of Mother Nature. And we always say, my Aunt Tanya uh, Ganella Fritchner is no longer with us, and my Aunt Nan, her sister, is here with us today. Um, she would always say, Mother Earth is a relative, not a resource. Mm -hmm. and, and although it seems that those things are separate, right, they're not, they're very much connected. And I think that that's where the problems lie. Well, our country, as we all know, is famous for borrowing things conveniently. So, you know, when we came, my point of being a nation of immigrants, when we came and we found the, the, when we found the indigenous people here, uh, we learned from the indigenous people. And there are things that are omitted in history which uh, really Dr. Wagner just brilliantly brings out in her melding of the voices in the women's suffrage movement. You know, I urge everybody, it's an incredible read, to check it out when you have a chance. And because Dr. Wagner has told the truth in so many ways, this is a very controversial thing that we're talking about that we are setting up here because what happens, and everybody has seen the New York Times articles and everybody has seen the various people chiming in, oh, suffrage um, had no space for black women, there was no mention of that, There's, um, there hasn't been as much a clamor about Native American women, but really, I, I was delighted and excited about moderating this thing because we do have a chance at the truth here. Mm -hmm. And I would love for Dr. Wagner to just sort of give us a little bit of a feeling of that. You know, if I if I could, sure. if you'd, you'd allow me to, I, I think if we look at different phases of the movement, that we can get a, a clearer sense of what happened. So I think if we if we think maybe of a timeline, and it's thousand years here, maybe even further, and then we come to white settlers, and in the colonial period, the definition of voting, and and if you could help me with this, Julie was really based on property and the ownership of property. And so in some cases in the colonies where women owned property, they voted. And well, there we was had that in New York with the Property Act of 1848 for the married women. Yes, that was in New York. Actually, the, the earliest one was in Mississippi, and it was based on Native law. A Native woman took a case to court where she was demanding her property, and Mississippi said, based on, I think it was, would it have been Choctaw law, that, that um, married women could own their own property. And so they established that in, in Mississippi. But, um, so there were women that were voting, and the suffragists, some of them said, we're not asking for a new right, we're asking for the restitution of a right that our foremothers had. So colonial period, and they know this is going on, 
Then we come to the 1830s and the formation of the female anti-slavery societies. The very first one was African American women forming in Salem, Massachusetts. And by 1837, they formed a national organization. It is African American and white women working together. And not only are they working for an end to slavery, this blows my mind. This is a time period when I always assumed that women couldn't talk about anything that was you know, unseemly related to sex. They're calling out the institutional rape of enslaved women, the female anti-slavery societies in the 1830s are doing this. Now this is where the women are learning, African American and white, are learning to organize, they're learning political strategies, they're, they're developing their political voice in these anti-slavery movements. 1848 is typically, okay, I'm gonna commit another heresy here. I hope I commit at least 10 today. <laughs> Count them please if you would. <laughs> One of them is 1848 in Seneca Falls. That's, ta-da, the moment that we say we, do it. we begin, right? Well, maybe we should put it back to 1837, but I also, um, 1848 was a local convention, and I am waiting for the moment when a fourth grader who is doing her women's history project uh, discovers going through her local papers that, wow, there was a women's rights meeting here in 1846. You know, these historical moments are ones that we can keep pushing back. But we do know that by 1850, the first national women's rights convention was held. The 1850s are a time period in which every Almost every single issue that we're still dealing with today was raised. Equal pay for equal work was just a given as a as a, um, a something that had to be won in the 1850s and even before in some cases. Um, a woman's right to her own body was an issue that was raised then. Um, it was violence against women. It just they boom come out of the chute and they're raising all of the issues. 1860, the war starts and women say, well, the other thing that's going on during this time period is that the American Equal Rights Society is formed and every woman's rights convention, they time them to meet at the same time that the American Anti-Slavery Convention is meeting. And you scratch a suffragist and you find an abolitionist. You scratch an abolitionist and you find a suffragist. And I'm, so, I'm talking African American women and men, white women and men, and they're really, their work is almost inseparable. They're both doing the same thing, okay? 1860 through the war starts, and the women say, we're going to suspend our work, and we're going to support the war effort, but not under the conditions that Lincoln is saying. Lincoln at the point is saying that the war is being fought to preserve the Union. They gather 400,000 signatures, the largest number of signatures that has ever been gathered on United States soil to this point. And they say, we will only support this war effort as long as it is being fought to end slavery. The end of the war, the American Equal Rights Society and the, the women's rights meetings that have begun again, they come together and they form the American Equal Rights Society. Anti-slavery, women's rights, working together with a common goal, a single goal, universal suffrage. Quick question, is that where the parentheses in the Emancipation Proclamation says in warring states comes from? because of that technicality with Lincoln and the freeing of the slaves because it was only, it was really a document for the North because like you say, he's preserving the Union. But when you look, it says in warring states that they're thenceforward and forever free. 
in warring states. So if you're not a warring state and you had a slave, you were good. Yeah. <laughs> it, you could probably could do that better. But it is, it limits it to where it's unenforceable. Exactly. Because, but yeah. these are the loopholes that have yeah. carried through that we in the law that's that, a good point. you know, we, we, we really sort of, uh, it's like having the walls of prison and you get out of prison, but you, you depend on those walls after a while to sort of preserve you. But I want to come back to the whole point that you were making about the um, race and, and, yeah. and class system. Yeah. Um, because I think that I want to take advantage of the diversity we have here and also in the room. And I know that Brian is going to give me a signal when it's time to do some audience Q&A so uh, we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. But anyway, um, if we can just sort of bridge in sort of this timeline with the whole things because yeah. the New York Times has been for, for, um, specifically vehement. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several writers about the loss of the voice of the black women yeah. uh, in this whole suffrage movement, even to the point of saying there are 22 significant suffragists and of which seven were African American. Mm -hmm. Nameless and faceless still in the New York Times because they did not enumerate mm -hmm. these seven women can I call out some of them? Please do. And then I also would really like to talk about the, what happens. Here's this incredible coalition between African Americans and whites and what happens to it. But I'm just gonna call out a few names. The entire Purvis family, the Fortin family, the Rollins sisters in South Carolina who are the political operatives. These are families of people. Charles and Sarah Vermont. Um, well, of course, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman. I mean, we just sort of through, you know, we just go on and on and on. But the unsung, here's one Mary Ann Shad Carey and her sister Amelia. Mary Ann Shad Carey was the first African American woman to publish a weekly newspaper in the North American hemisphere. She goes on to, when the war starts, she comes back from Canada, where she's uh, publishing her newspaper. She comes back and becomes a military recruiter, recruiting African-American soldiers. She goes on to law school, she becomes an attorney, and she is a strong operative in the National Woman Suffrage Association. One single woman. We could spend what well, day or two history forget these about? people? I mean, that's very significant what you said. Yeah. And yet, I'm sure everybody in this room has been to school and we've never heard of this woman. Well, this is the painful part of the story. 1890, there are two different women's rights organizations that form in 1870. 18, in 1869. 1870s, they're working separately. American works for the vote state by state. Well, think about the implication of this. This is a time when the southern states are working to stop African American men from voting. If I say, please give me the right to vote, doesn't that also say you can take the vote away from black men? Because when the nation is trying to figure out who gets to decide who votes, is it the states or the feds? This plays into states' rights, the American work. National says, nope, we're going for a federal amendment. 1890, the two groups merge. It is a messy, dirty political move. I dish the dirt in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens after 1890, and this is the place of accountability that we must take before we can celebrate 2020. And that is that the National American Woman Suffrage Association practices racism as policy. They say, give women the right to vote because white women outnumber Negroes and immigrants and woman suffrage is a way to maintain white native-born supremacy. They use that language white supremacy, and, and that becomes policy. They also allow the state auxiliaries, they're practicing state by state, give women the vote, and they allow their state societies who have autonomy 
to work for the vote for white women only, some of them do, they allow them to segregate, which some of them do, and they allow them to work for Jim Crow laws. Here's the painful admission. Part of the reason that Jim Crow laws had strength was because suffragists fought for them. And it's important to mention with the National Women's Suffrage Association, this is a direct link back to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony as the founders of that group. Well, actually, the, the National American, when it merges, really takes on the Americans, their, their constitution, their states' rights focus, all of that is really, and the interesting thing is, that while Anthony and Stanton are, they are absolutely racist in their statements during that 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment period, guess where the African Americans go? Do they go to the American or do they go to the National? They, they go, go to Stanton national. and Anthony. <laughs> and nothing changed over the course of the 200 years since. You know, it, it's very interesting in the um, racial and, and uh, economic and so forth dynamic because it's it's a, it's a caste and class system. You know. Well, I think this raises some very interesting questions um, about how we should remember the legacy of the Nineteenth Amendment uh, because, on the one one hand, um, you could read in Sally's book some of the amazing and uh, ahead of their time ways of thinking um, that you see in the suffragists of the 19th century, but really what enables the 19th Amendment to, uh, to be ratified. Uh, and just a quick primer on constitutional amendments in the United States. We have notoriously one of the most difficult constitutions to amend under Article 5. Uh, you need two-thirds of both houses of Congress and then three-quarters of all the states. Uh, legislatures to ratify. Um, that's how hard it is to get uh, an amendment, and I believe the last time we amended the Constitution was before I was old enough to vote, and I'm in my 40s. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so because it's so notoriously hard, what it means is that you'll only get an amendment when there is sufficient consensus uh, by people who have influence and people who vote. Uh, and what it means is that the 19th Amendment, uh, part of its success is a success brought to you by uh, a politics uh, that uh, we might actually think of today, looking back, as being against the original principles um, of the suffragists. Uh, but the reality of this country is that things that are politically successful uh, tend to come with a politics uh, shared with people with whom we might disagree. Uh, but we have to make coalitions with people with whom we vehemently disagree, sometimes people who hold pretty offensive views, uh, in order to actually get an amendment or in order to get something that actually succeeds politically. And that's something I think that's very difficult uh, about American politics and about, about constitutional change in this country. You know, the, the one thing that I wonder about with that, though, is that there's a way in which historians have looked at an inevitability to, you know, we had to get the South, had to, to, to play to racism to get it, but I wonder if we might think about that question differently. What if they had chosen different allies? What if they had chosen to support the rights of African American men to vote? What if instead of fighting against immigrants, they had fought for immigrant rights and, and courted the immigrant men rather than alienating them? You know, by the time the suffrage amendment was ratified. The Ku Klux Klan endorsed it. You know, by the time it was ratified, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know if I would have supported it. Because they had brought in the Women's Christian Temperance Union that wanted to put God in the Constitution, prayer in the public schools. So, so I'm actually it's, writing about the Women's Christian oh, Temperance good. Union right now. And I think this is actually very, uh, that's been written out of suffrage history mm -hmm. uh, in a way. And I think if you actually it's look closely here. at the documents, uh, Francis Willard was actually a very interesting figure. And there are ways in which they were actually trying to draw in black women in the South. And it really turns, and, uh, and the temperance movement is actually one um, that is advocating for um, changes in married women's property laws, mm -hmm. uh, the liberation of women uh, in the context of sexual assault, raising the age of consent so that you could actually prosecute people who sleep with 
uh, 12 year old girls, right? So they're advocating for a lot of the same things that the early French suffragists are advocating for um, in the late 19th century. Uh, but there's also very complicated anti immigrant and racist politics that develops later. Uh, and the church, you know. Right. Bring and not the policy of, of put God in the Constitution. And Jesus Christ is the head of the government. They That's never right. actually advocated yes, that. Yes, they did. Well, well, I was also going to say, did we qualify what the temperance movement was? Did we explain that? Because I don't think everybody might be familiar with it. That's another class that was missed in the history lessons. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union is formed in 1873 after, in a moment where there are crusades um, all around the country. Uh, and uh, what's really interesting, and then they have a very charismatic president, uh, Francis Willard, who takes over in 1879. Matilda uh, Joseph Gates called her the most dangerous woman in America. I feel when the WCTU took the policy of, of placing God in the Constitution, destroying the wall of separation of church and state. But they also very significantly and that advocated had other for home things. protection. Uh, which is, uh, they said women needed to the vote in order to uh, protect their own status within the home, right? So they were actually advocating for things like women's equal guardianship over their children, um, advocating for raising the age of consent to sex, um, advocating for women's right to own their own earnings. These were all things that they thought, we, so it wasn't just we need the vote just to have the vote, but we need to change all the laws that make it actually a myth. Uh, it was often said, it was said in a Supreme Court concurring opinion by a justice in a Supreme Court decision upholding the exclusion of women from the legal profession. A uh, Supreme Court justice says that it's because women are, uh, their divine province is the home, right? Uh, and um, if you think about what the legal reality of, was women, of women in the 19th century, um, women actually did not have dominion over the home. Uh, and the Christian Temperance Union thought that by focusing on alcohol regulation, prohibiting alcohol, um, and actually addressing the problem of drunk husbands either dom committing dom domestic violence or drinking away the family wage, thereby making it necessary for women to work and own their own earnings. Uh, that was the way in which they advocated for prohibition. There were parts of the Christian Temperance Union, of course, um, that were more interested in things that um, um, that you're calling dangerous, and rightfully so. But so much of the movement in the 19th century was actually focused on uh, positions that we would today describe as feminist, uh, and that's a legacy of prohibition, which I think has been somewhat written out of the history. But uh, but you know, many historians there's there's a rich academic literature by historians in the mid to late 20th century that reconstruct that. that history One of the generally. problems that it raised was that it really brought the anti-suffrage movement into its full strength because the liquor industry brought in tremendous amounts of money. And that's why the 18th Amendment, you yeah, know, they give, so they give. it is prohibition. Before, yeah. right. I think that it the works. origin of all of this, though, is the doctrine of discovery. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of the bigger problem, right? That's what it's brought all of this to today when they came here, Europeans came here under the guise of the Doctrine of Discovery that they were gonna subdue, vanquish, right? Any non-Christian people, um, that included their women, right? I mean, whether they were Christian or not Christian, um, they owned them. They were, it, there was an ownership in that. Um, and that's, that's what we're talking about, that's where, so if we wanna fix it, you almost have to go all the way back to look at the very beginning, you know, how did that start and how did we get this far? I think, it, you know, we're built, America's built on a Judeo-Christian society, a Judeo-Christian tradition. And I think if we look all the way back to 1066 with William the Conqueror, you know, when he put the Magna Carta together and, you know, they put all of these rules and the state shall do this and the citizen shall do that and so forth. It, all of these things are really amazing and wonderful because there is no originality in this stuff. All of our laws, it, it all ebbs and flows from somewhere. The same way our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution ebb, ebb and flowed from indigenous law. So, I mean, I would love for Betty to just enlighten us for a few minutes on that. Um, point. Absolutely, I mean, I think it's so important, you know, you brought up constitutional law. It wasn't written, we were an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it any less substantial. Um, you know, our, our founders, when our, our great law of peace came to us, 
You know, we have laws and instructions of behavior and, and personal conduct, right, that follow us through. And, and something that you just said, too, that it was built on, Je uh, what did you say? Uh, Judeo-Christian. Judeo-Christian, right, values. It was actually, it's, it's born out of, of pure dominance, this doctrine of domination. It's born out of racism, right? Um, and, and the term racism, you can look it up, it really means it's like the absence of spirituality, right? Like, I mean, it makes sense when you say it that way. But when you really look at it, like, and you break it down to that point, it was about um, how to control and dominate to their favor and all the way through up until now. Um, and I think that's the difference. You know, when you leave out everybody's voice, right, you can dominate. You can control, you can determine what somebody else is gonna do, but that's what brought us to this place. So like this administration right now is really, um, it, it's kind of, um, it was inevitable. Like, you know, the administration that we have now, uh, the Trump administration was inevitable. If you're beginning from the doctrine of discovery, he, he's just an inevitable, right, uh, product of that. Can you say what the doctrine of discovery is? I'm oh, sure. sure. Everybody knows. So that was a papal bull um, given by St. Nicholas, and it basically gave the right to um, Christian countries to take over if they were to come upon lands that were considered uninhabited by Christians, then they were what's called terra nullis, meaning void or empty lands. Um, we had rich, you know, culture. We don't call them religions. This is a way of life. Like, I don't go to church every Sunday. It's every something that I practice every single day, which is completely different. You know, it's completely intertwined, and it's, it's deeply rooted in Mother Earth. Um, and so this papal bull gave, gave them the right, right, Europe, uh, France, to come here and say, we're going to claim this land for our own. Um, and this happened even in, uh, on my nation. So the French Jesuits came with a proclamation that they were gonna own 600 square miles of land. I mean, can you imagine the audacity? I'm just gonna roll up to the Queen of England and I'm gonna, or to France and hand over and say, you know, no, I, I own all of this area. Um, and they were gonna do it regardless. Um, and that meant killing, raping, um, burning villages, um, and they know that the heart of our community is our women, you know, because we have such a strong presence and that if you really destroy the women, you know, you're gonna destroy that community. And that's what happened throughout uh, North America and South America, Central America, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, all these countries, it's all based on that one doctrine. And, and to get the Catholic Church to repudiate it because you don't want it to just, um, rescind it, you want it repudiated, because uh, to repudiate it would mean that they, it, that has legal implications. And it still has effect today. It still has effect today. It's still used mm -hmm. uh, as recently as 2005 in the United States and 2011 in Canada. And I can't even imagine my sister from Australia is not here right now, but I'm sure she could tell you um, how it affects uh, her communities as well. But, um, you know, so I'm fortunate. I always say that I'm I'm grateful and fortunate for where I come from. Um, well, you know, Betty, different. the wonderful thing about what you just shared with us, uh, this is the notion of power. And you see, when you have people, and, and it's broken down by gender, by race, by class, you, you, you stumble on something that people who never had power could never access. So therefore, they never had a voice or a say so because, frankly, they were like cattle; they were chattel. Okay, and you know, a long time ago, we all learned in school about white man's burden. You know, they they had to come in and they had to teach the indigenous people because you know about God and religion because this was the savior method and, and mechanism uh, by which to control. You know, the slaves were never taught to read because that, again, is power. So once you really understand, you know, racism and, and other things we can't control are constants. So it doesn't make sense to cry and weep about stuff that you have no control over because by virtue of our DNA all being different, we look different, we are different, we have different habits and attitudes. 
it's never going to be one kumbaya chorus, as they say. But what we need to do is learn how to respect and tolerate and, cele and celebrate our differences. Mm -hmm. Because here is another element of power that if we really could figure it out, ah, we might have a new playbook. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would really like to sort of sum up our discussion. And I want to thank Dr. Roche Wagner for this amazing book, The Women's Suffrage Movement, which you will all be able to um, get your own glance at. And it was really a wonderful read of the many different who's asking and who's telling stories. So I, I want to thank her for this amazing, this is a life work, really, that's summed up on these pages. And I want to thank her for being with us today. I want to thank Betty for sharing with us how all of the wonderful stories and the indigenous way. And I want to thank Julie for bringing the Constitution to the party. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, I'd like to turn to the audience and see if we have any questions that uh, we can feel. Uh, Brian will just take the mic and just see who uh, has a question. Gentlemen, right here. My question was, uh, you mentioned to me something about the 19th Amendment that there was some challenge to its legality. Could you explain that or talk a little bit about that? So, um, so there was some litigation uh, in around 19th. Uh, Isabella? Okay. Okay. Uh, in, in, uh, in around 1920. Uh, and, um, and it was argued that the 19th Amendment was not a valid amendment because uh, you couldn't actually have a federal amendment uh, that would change uh, voting, which really belonged to the states, right? And it wasn't really based on any textual provision. So in modern constitutional law parlance, I think this was a way the challengers would say this is an unconstitutional constitutional amendment, if that concept makes any sense. Mm -hmm. There are some constitutions today that have certain unamendable provisions. So the German Basic Law says that the provision guaranteeing the protection of human dignity is unamendable, which means if you wanted to say there's no longer human dignity, you'd have to have a revolution and write a new constitution because you can't amend it within the terms of, of that constitution. So there was an argument that was made that that was not successful uh, in 1920, uh, that if you tried to give a federal right to vote, right? Because remember, back in those days, they really thought about states as being this, this, um, the, the source of citizenship. Until you had the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, you didn't have an idea of federal, um, the, the idea that uh, the federal government could give any one state citizenship, right? Uh, and so similarly here, it's being argued that if the federal constitutional provision says that you can't deny uh, the right to vote on account of sex, um, that that actually violates something that we fundamentally understand to belong to the states. Uh, and, and because the federal system and this, uh, and we also have a constitutional provision that we preserves powers not mentioned in the constitution to the states, the 10th amendment, uh, that uh, having a federal amendment that suddenly gives women the right to vote uh, is just an unconstitutional constitutional uh, amendment. Uh, it's an argument that fails, but it's attempted. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, right here. Uh, you had mentioned we need a new playbook. Well, that was pretty much here when Europeans came to this country. And it's not so much a playbook as it is a cultural reorientation to the earth. And when people arrived, the Haudenosaunee actually um, convened with the founding fathers of this country to create a new um, form of democracy. And um, we are from um, central New York. I grew up two miles north of the Onondaga Nation. I am a Mohawk citizen at Akwesasne. And um, my husband directed um, a repurposing of a Jesuit fort that was at Onondaga's sacred lake. And this is where the Confederacy was formed the place, the sacred place where these five nations came together. And um, we've worked diligently to pull together all the educational institutions in the area to tell this story. And we arrived to the name for this place, we call it SCANO, the Great Law of Peace Center. And the very first thing you learn when you come into the center is what SCANO, Nyawenha SCANO means. It means we are thankful that you are well and to be at peace. And for you to become peaceful, you can only do that through your proper relationship with the natural world. And that's why women were so powerful at this encounter, because they understood that proper place that's in balance. 
They distribute the clan. They connect each child that's born to the earth. And it's not that we're all different racially. That has really nothing to do with it because as varied we are in race, the earth is multi-faceted. Um, so we have to listen to the earth. It's ever changing moment by moment. And what it provides us are the gifts to sustain our lives as human beings. Uh, thank you for that. Please give my regards to Chief Porter. Oh, yes. <laughs> the young lady in the back. Yes, hello. Um, I'm, I just wanted to <clears throat> uh, enlarge a little bit about what you uh, said on the doctrine of discovery. I think um, what the basic uh, issue here would be that it's, we're talking about the church, the church uh, um, ruling uh, over this, uh, somehow it gets itself involved in ruling uh, in, the, in this country. And um, what uh, Sally said about uh, <clears throat> keeping, God, keeping uh, God out of the cons, out of the Constitution is the most important thing. You had um, said, "Why didn't we learn about such and such in history?" Okay. Well, that is the that is the most. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the people in charge, say, of this country, have left out of history the things they don't want want you to know, and that's why we keep coming up with all kind of discoveries. Uh, and mostly can find them in local newspapers and, and things like that. These, in what, it takes one or two generations for, for, for events to be lost uh, from memory if they're not coming down to us in written form. And one of the things that I think that's the most impor important thing that's, that uh, in Sally's <clears throat> um, uh, professional life is, is, is the unearthing, say, of the writings of a woman named Matilda Jocelyn Gage, um, who was best uh, friends with Susan B. Anthony and it was with Katie Stanton. Um, and she said, <clears throat> and that's why she disappeared from history, that religion is the greatest oppressor of women. And um, I mean, you see how it props up every so often it, uh, among a conservative people, right, in, in order to deprive women of certain rights, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very radical. I mean, a radical idea. <laughs> how, you gonna, how are you going to uh, keep the church out of our, our political business? But um, it's not it. But it's not necessarily about keeping the church out. It's about boundaries, frankly. And I think that as we grow older as a nation and working together, as we understand uh, peoples and cultures, and as we work on uh, an inclusion and an intersectional mentality in how we do business and how we um, set policies, I think that it is important that there's a place for the church. I mean, what, the whole reason for the Seneca Falls Convention, one of the main ones, was because the women in church could not read a Bible passage. All the reading was done by the men. You know, you, you look back in history and Dr. Wagner can give you chapter and verse. Uh, it seemed like the Society of Friends were the most progressive, the Quakers, because they allowed women to read in the church, in the church or the worship setting, as you would say because they didn't really have church as you know the, the Christian society deems church. So I think that I'm glad for your point about Matilda Jocelyn Cage because organized religion is something else, but we don't want to go into that at this point. I'd like more questions about suffrage if we can while we have Sally here, the young lady over here. I'm Julie Walsh, uh, thanks so much, I read Sisters in Spirit, and wanted to ask a little bit about that book and the new book, um, if, oh, if a lot of that um, information is in the new book, if there's new information about the Haudenosaunee and the Onondaga women's influence on the early suffragettes, um, and if there was anything um, uh, 
I wanted to ask you kind of if the, what was the kind of most interesting story that you had have, have learned over the years, this book or before, uh, about those early suffragettes direct encounters with the Onondaga. Thanks. Um, the the book um, that you so kindly referenced, Sisters in Spirit, the Haudenosaunee Influence on Women's Rights, uh, looks at the, the sort of general picture of, but it doesn't include the original writings, just snippets of. Um, this book begins with the writings of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Alice Fletcher about how clearly they're influenced by Native women. So it's the Haudenosaunee, but it's also, they're looking internationally at indigenous women um, and their influence. As, and it's, it's some pretty uh, impressive scholarship for the time that they, one, one tiny piece, if I might just answer that, uh, Lucretia Mott spent, uh, before she came to Waterloo, and she and five of her Quaker friends and Elizabeth Cady Stanton planned the, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention, um, she had been spending time, I think about a month, at Cataraugus, which is a Seneca community. And she, in the one um, account that I've been able to find, the only written record of that summer by Lucretia Mott was a letter that she published in the Liberator, the anti-slavery paper. And it's like uh, three, or, and it's in the book, and it's three or four paragraphs about, uh, the, Haudenosh about the Haudenosaunee, spending time with the Seneca. And you know, it's this wonder at, that, you know, how they, how they live their lives. There's a small paragraph about Seneca Falls and the convention. So I don't know if that's, you know, her. She also spent time that summer with the, uh, the freedom community in um, the fugitive slaves, the freedom takers that had gone to Canada where they could have freedom um, after the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, this actually was before, but there already was um, a good community uh, that had gone to the greater freedom in Canada. So she writes a little bit about that, but mostly it's about the, the, uh, the Seneca. I just want to clarify for some people, because we heard at two different points in the audience about the Haudenosaunee and also from Bailey before, it's the same thing as St. Iroquois Nation and Federation. Uh, there's six uh, uh, tribes coming together that consists of the Iroquois Nation. Yes, the word Iroquois is a derogatory term given to us, but but we're not Iroquois, we're Haudenosaunee. That's okay. our, our own word for each other, so if that helps Thank to clarify you. it. And I just wanna say that women's rights are inherent, as is Mother Earth's, right? We have the right and responsibility to protect her and all living beings or we will cease to exist. And then how can women's rights, right, now even within the U.S., I'm thinking of like the U.S. and not the Haudenosaunee, but how can they propel that forward is by supporting and standing up for the rights of Mother Earth. They defend her, they will also gain their proper place. Awesome. And Julie, you have a question? Yes, I had a question for Sally because I feel that the um, publication of your book at this moment, uh, one can't help um, think about the fact that uh, we're reaching the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 2020. Uh, and in the world where I sit, lawyers, law professors, sociologists, political scientists, there's all, all forms of commemorations being planned, celebrations, critical seminars um, around the centennial of the 19th Amendment. And I guess given the rich critical history um, of the suffrage movement represented in the book and the text that you've collected, I was just wondering what you think of uh, these centennial cele celebrations and commemorations. What should our attitude be towards them? Um, how, how do we embrace uh, what was achieved uh, without, um, over, um, without erasing um, some of the exclusions um, that enabled the suffrage amendment to, uh, to be successful? And it is, it's like we're in this moment of planning. I'm on the governor's 
commission to look at uh, the suffrage centennial in New York State with Sharon. And, uh, you know, on a number of calls and, and organizations that are working toward this moment. And this is the most troubling thing for me. Um, how do we do this? And I think this is a question for all of us to be thinking about. The, the place that I come to, and, and in the end of the book, I call for a truth and reconciliation process. That we really need to take accountability before we can celebrate. Because the celebration in itself will not be inclusive. You know, not everybody got the vote in 1920. Some people got it, whether they wanted it or not, Native Americans in 1924, citizenship forced on, you know, that's complicated. Some choose to, some choose not to, to maintain sovereignty. You know, Asian Americans didn't get the vote until, you know, they became citizens later. Uh, handicapped people couldn't make it to the polls until the 70s you know, and have that protected. So the creation of democracy is an ongoing process. 1920 is one step along the way, as you sort of painted the, you know, the longer history. But I think that the place of accountability, of truth telling, of saying, you know, we need to acknowledge the cost of suffrage as well as the victory. The acknowledgement comes first, the accountability comes first, and then we find the place when everyone's voice is represented. We find the place of what can we celebrate. That's great. And last question. Uh, last question, right back here. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Danielle. I'm a PhD student here at CUNY, interested in women and women's and gender history. Uh, I have a very simple question to all of you. Do you believe in? And I think that's where the conversation was heading to. And it's a side a thought related to what you were just, in, just pointing out. Do you think in 1920 women won the vote or were granted the vote? Ooh. Ready, you go first. Well, I, um, it's, not, it's not my, um, my history, and so I'm pretty sure for the Sally. We don't, we don't have to vote. I, we, we choose our leadership, and we yank them out if they're not acting right. So, oh, you can do it at any time. Or... I, yeah. I, if, I would if I could. <laughs> I, I think that, that the, um, we fought, but we didn't fight alone as women. Uh, the men who were allies were absolutely essential. Um, you know, racism doesn't get overturned unless white people are part of the issue, part of the, the solution. And, and it, women couldn't get the vote unless men voted for women to vote. And so, you know, it's, a, um, it's an ally work as well. So we fought hand in hand uh, and toward the end, when African American women were excluded from the National American Women's Suffrage Association, they organized on their own. And their work is as impressive as their voting record in the 20s. Um, what century are we in? <laughs> the last election, uh, the presidential election, uh, which, which was pretty impressive with African American women. I think there are many different ways to interpret your question, but one thing that I'm interested in looking at um, is uh, how many women actually voted uh, after 1920. Uh, and you can, you know, there are many different ways you can study that question. What's so interesting to me, so another part of my research looks at women in other countries right after they get the vote. Uh, and in Germany, uh, I think 90% of women show up to the polls as soon as they get the votes. Right after World War I, a lot of men are dead. Uh, and so they actually get women in the Constituent Assembly that write the Constitution of the Weimar Republic or adopt the Constitution of the Weimar Republic. Um, what I've noted, although I haven't, um, uh, my, I think there's much more research to do, uh, but I've seen some sources in the historical literature that suggest that even though women won the vote, that there was a huge social movement that made it possible uh, for the 19th Amendment to be adopted and ratified, but actually, uh, you could think of it as they were granted the vote because um, subsequently, you don't see high rates of women voting. 
um, after that. And there are a lot of different um, explanations um, for why uh, women are not voting uh, in uh, really high numbers even after uh, they uh, are, and, and that's how I understood your question. Maybe we should think of it, they, they were only granted the vote because you don't see them exercising the vote um, to its fullest potential. Although it may be because of other barriers that existed, both in law and in culture, um, that prevented women, even women who wanted to vote, from voting despite the fact that they had the formal constitutional right to do so. So I'm gonna answer your question in a very different way. Uh, I think it was a good distinction you put about rented versus one, and I think my answer centers on when people do not have power, they don't win anything. So I would default more to rented without saying rented as such, because if you don't have the power, you don't have control. Very simple. So I think, oh, do you want to say something, Brian? Go ahead. Oh, so uh, that, that is what I would think uh, makes a point. And, and reinforcing that, even though you say about the right to vote, it's not really validated because we have something called the Voting Rights Act, which comes up every 25 years for, um, uh, to see if we're gonna still keep that. It comes up for a vote every 25 years. Is it gonna be something we continue or not? What is that about? So it comes back to the same thing. If you don't have the power, you also don't have the control. So thank you. I want to thank you all for um, participating on, and being our panelists tonight. So thanks. Sharon, mm -hmm. Marley, Julie, Marie, and Sally, thank you for this great piece of work. Um, so Sally is going to be at the back table. Um, where you can ask her more questions and speak with her. I want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Um, we hope you enjoyed the evening and look forward to perhaps seeing you again soon. And on behalf of Civically Reengaged Women, the co-hosting uh, partner for today, I'd like to thank the CUNY Grad Center. I'd like to thank um, Joy, the president of CUNY, for having us here. I'd like to thank Dean Peterson and Julie and all of the um, folks here from CUNY uh, for having us here. It's a wonderful Women's History Month presentation. We thank Sally and we thank Betty from coming all the way from Syracuse to be with us to share this amazing work, this life work. And we wish everybody a happy Women's History